point of the book, I think, is how much, you know, what would you exchange for complete freedom? So and she was a woman in, what, 16... Right. Hi, everyone. I am Kristen Anderson, inter Information Desk Clerk at McCracken County Public Library and the moderator of the Happily Ever After Book Club. And welcome to a special year-end edition of Conversations with the Writer. I have my usual co-host here, Miss Tammy Blackwell, Director at McCracken Marshall County <laughs> Public Library. My goodness. Blech, blech. I'm Marshall everywhere. County <laughs> Library. And a uh, best-selling author. And we have a special guest today. Day, Miss Sarah McGowan, who is the Adult Services Manager here at McCracken County Public Library. Um, we're going to talk about um, reading, what we read this year or what we liked this year, why we didn't read as much this year, and give you some of our year-end uh, best of recommendations. Um, quick disclaimer, the opinions that we express here are our own and do not necessarily reflect those of the libraries for which we work. All right, so the first thing I want to get into before we get into recommendations is, and I've heard this from a lot of places, that folks don't feel like are reading less than they have in the past. Um, in the past year or two, a lot of us read a lot last year during quarantine. Um, and some of us have tapered off not only from that, but from our pre-quarantine mm -hmm. reading. So why are we reading, is, it just, is there not as good material? Is it something we don't need the escape? We don't want to, we don't have the time? Why, why aren't we reading as much? I think there's a lot of reasons, but I think for me the answer was in what you just said was that in early quarantine, this thing has been going on for so long, but in the beginning of the beginning, like in 2020, I read all the time because I had so much time to do it. And I thought, oh, here in this two week period where I'm at home and will surely beat this <laughs> rush to disease, I will get <laughs> caught up on all my reading. And it, and it dragged on and it dragged on and dragged on. And so for me, I associate a ton of reading with early pandemic in my head, and it kind of makes me sad. Oh. And I don't know, it sucks. I, like, when you're, the three of us are, are big readers, and it's like a part of our personality. Like, yeah. we, you know, identify um, with that, like, at a really high level. And it's kind of heartbreaking when you feel like, well, I'm not really an expert on that anymore. I don't feel like I can really speak on that anymore because I just don't read all, all the new stuff that I used to. So it's really hard, and I think that is, for me, that has been part of it, just that um, I just associated it with a darker time in my life, and now I seem to want to fill my time with other stuff. And it might also just be that there's so much media now. That's like, a good point, you know? yeah. And there's just so many other options. I don't know, what do you think, Tammy? I'm gonna I'm gonna go even darker than <laughs> Sarah here. Um, for me personally, I've had trouble with depression this mm -hmm. past year. I've really Same. struggled with it, um, and so one of the things of depression is you no longer find joy in the things that have always brought you joy. Mm -hmm. um, and so reading has always been that thing for me, the thing that brought me joy. And I just um, I really have trouble getting into it, and I'm just so exhausted all the time and I don't think that that's just a me thing or just a depression thing I think as a society we are mm -hmm. all exhausted nobody mm -hmm. you know um, we've all reached this like maximum capacity mm -hmm. for everything <laughs> and we're all just kind of wore out and I'm almost you know I'm almost too tired to read I have been reading a ton of web comics like you know uh -huh. like just like the little four panel things yeah I mean, I, I probably now follow like 15 different ones of those on Instagram, and that's how I spend my time because that's how much concentration I have. Yeah. I can, oh, okay. I can read these four panels that take me 20 seconds and be perfectly happy, but 
Um, I can't make it m through more than a couple of pages of a book before my mind starts to just drift. Do you think that, so we are people that identify strongly with like being readers, with we can do this. So I feel like now I almost identify more with people who have always said like, I don't have the attention span. Yeah. I, I'm like, yeah. oh, oh, I get it. Like, yeah. at the end of the day, I'm too tired and I just want to veg out. And I could never understand that before. I'm like, this is the comfort thing, but like, I get it. Now. Yeah. Yeah, it, I realize that it really is a lot easier to throw something up on the TV and yeah. not or have scroll to. through Twitter or whatever. Yeah. Like, this requires less of me. Uh, and it really is. It, like It's like a muscle, and, you know, if yeah. you're not using it all the time. So, I don't know. I hope it's maybe more empathetic and maybe less judgmental. <laughs> yeah, I've read I'm about on pace, my mm -hmm. usual pace. But what I have noticed is I used to average, oh, probably a couple books a week, um, probably about 10 to 12 books a month. And I was looking to see, I think it was last month, I only finished like seven books, which is way off my normal pace. And it's because I'm reading less. Um, I, like you said, with other media, I'm watching more television. I'm addicted to playing Animal Crossing on my Switch. Mm -hmm. And the time at night or during the day where I would normally be reading, I usually read like an hour at lunch, an hour when I got home, and an hour before I go to bed. Now I'm doing about 30 minutes at lunch and maybe 30 minutes at night. And it's resulted in my, I'm just, my output, I'm just reading a lot less. And the other problem that I'm having is finding the material that I want to read. My authors um, aren't writing as much. Or some of them have retired completely. Because they feel the same way that we do. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. They're not exactly inspired. Right. And I'm not at my most creative right now. God mm -hmm. knows. So yeah. I can't expect yeah. more from, yeah. although it would be helpful, <laughs> writers. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, they're in the same place we are. Like, there's nowhere in the world that you can escape this whole COVID exhaustion thing that's yeah. going on. So, yeah, there's... There's less output, and, you know, even the ones from some of my favorite authors I mentioned to you guys before we started, I get about 10% in, and I'm like, I'm not feeling it. Yeah. Yeah. I have ha tried to change my expectation and, like, still count it. Yeah, I read a lot of nonfiction, and I'm like, you know, it still counts. If I don't finish this, if I read 50 pages, that's still, like, 50 pages I read. Yeah. Or whatever. I saw something on Twitter when I was on Twitter and not reading and I that was something about a, a reader had uh, tweeted at a writer like can you give us some happy books like we need they're like we live in the same world that you do it's not like I'm a vending machine and I can just like <laughs> pop out so like it has to be my lived experience and so yeah. it's gonna be and so I wonder if some of it for people that have found it less that like they want a certain kind of thing but the people are stewing in the same, you know, yeah. authors are yeah. stewing in the same stuff that the rest of us are. So what's getting written is now what we want to read. Do we think um, there'll be Im improvement in 2022? Keep on hoping, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I would have said I would have said that back in, gosh, a year ago. When I said next year will be so much better. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, personally, I hope that for me, like, just... I have a better outlook and an attitude towards things then um, and just can get into stuff. I mean, really, it's I, I, I get a couple of pages into something and I'm like, mm, nope. <laughs> It'll be like, I enjoy this. This is well done. I should be, you know, this is totally my kind of thing. Yeah. Any other time, I would be eating this up. Meh. <laughs> you know, I'll yeah. set it aside. There's a lot of meh going on. But do you know, I have also noticed... That people who were not readers before necessarily, yeah. some of them are really finding comfort in reading at this time. I love that for them. Um, yeah. You know, it, I, I've seen several people on my Facebook feed, you know, post what they've read in the past month, and they're reading several books in the month. And I'm like, hey, I remember when I used to do that. Uh -huh. um, so I are like the people that got really fit or taught themselves <laughs> French. <laughs> <laughs> Baked a lot of bread. Yes. I just ate a lot of bread. <laughs> I did uh, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that, I mean, it's, you know, and so obviously these past two years have affected all of us differently, um, but they've affected all of us. Mm -hmm. And reading habits, I'm sure, is one of those for a large percentage of people, whether they're reading less or more or something different than they did before. Um, there may be people coming to romance that never thought they were romance readers because yes. they need that happily ever after now. That formula is very important. It is. Yeah. It is. Going in and knowing that it's going to end on a positive note is super encouraging. <laughs> and we've talked about that before, having that comfort of knowing that everything will turn out right in the end. That's pretty powerful for when you, we don't know everything's going to turn out right yeah, in our country. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> we would like dark. to hope it will, it's but... Dark. <laughs> <laughs> On this episode of Conversations with a Writer Goes Dark. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's break let's up from this. Let's talk about something we let's like. talk about what did we <laughs> like. Now, I brought books I loved, and I brought a couple that I loathed. Did oh, good. Those same? are the most fun. Okay. Um, let's start with Sarah. Guess give us something that you like, something that you love. And you brought props. I, I, I brought so props. Um, one of them was all checked out, so I'll just tell you about it. All the, and I don't know that I have a book that I love, but I will say, so um, the newest, newest, Jonathan Franzen, and he, people love to hate him. I think he I had a good set. Yeah, him. but... I love him, and I loved his new one. He had a new one, which is a which is a big deal. They don't come out, you know, they don't just pop out mm -hmm. all the time. So he had a new one come out called Crossroads, and it is set in um, late '60s, it, kind of in a um, like a left wing religious space. I would say, kind of hippie religious space, and. Um, it really fits in with my love of cults and the 70s. And so it was definitely right to love cults. <laughs> um, and so I really, really loved it. It's, um, all the characters, if you're one of those people that um, like you have to like the characters or you won't like the book, you will hate this book because all the characters are awful. <laughs> But interesting and kind of good, you know what I mean? Um, but I absolutely hated the ending with a lot of passion. So there's on your hate list. Okay. Do better, friends. And no, I really, I, he's great. But it, like, I think it's going to be a series. It was one of those. Oh. And that's my pet peeve. If it, like, the book should stand on its own. Yes. Yeah, I love series writing. I do. I love knowing what's going to, I love thinking that there's more to the story, but I also want it to wrap up in a way yeah. that if I don't read another part in the series, I'm happy. This was like a, it just ends. Oh, kind then of, I don't, which, yeah. I don't like the ones that are deliberately baiting you into a part two. Yes. That bugs me. I basically want like an epilogue that says, and their grandkids, you know, yes. were named. Yes. I like those kind that but it was really really good and it has I'm, a really pretty cover too and i'm hiding under the table because i am the queen of my book bait you into the next <laughs> <laughs> you, can bait me. Even you can bait me a, like a cliffhanger is one thing but i don't know anyway, <laughs> but um so i for me this was the year of um or the two years of like weird obsessive interests where I get really into a thing and I got all this time and so I like fall into Wikipedia holes about like the aforementioned cult. Yes. You know. Mm -hmm. I watched a lot of cult programming. I did a lot of cult year. murdery, true crime yeah. kind of stuff. So this one um, kind of fits in with the true crime thing and I have a lot of thoughts about that. That's a whole nother, a whole nother programming thing but um, this one is a true crime book but it also has a lot of substance. Like, I don't think anyone can lie. Like, sometimes true crime is a little exploitive, you know? Yeah. Um, and so this one is set in, um, it's called Last Call, A True Story of Love, Lust, and Murder in Queer New York by Elon Green. So this is set in, uh, think like AIDS, ep AIDS epidemic, New York City, epicenter of AIDS in 1992, Midtown Manhattan there is a serial killer working through the gay community Ooh. and that really so they're also they're dealing with AIDS there's also this serial killer goes uncaught for a really really long time so there's tons of anger in the community you know righteous yeah. anger like there's all these different things that are coming after us you know and just how kind of the community blossoms and comes together so it was 
interesting for the true crime aspects, but also just got me really, really interested in like the evolution of like gay rights liberation, yeah. that kind of thing. Super, super interesting. I learned so much about it, kind of thing you don't learn a lot about in school. That's true. You know, they don't talk a lot along about with that. other movements, you know, maybe maybe your history class got to the civil rights movement, but it probably didn't get to the gay rights movement. So. Um, so this just sent me in a whole different area. It's really, really interesting and should appeal to a lot of different kinds of readers. Um, that led me into, I have no particular, like, I've been to New York. I've, I'm not from New York. I don't know why. I'm, I wouldn't have said I'm overly interested in a social history of New York, but I saw this one recommended for that one. You know how that kind of chain right. step goes. So this one's called New York, New York, New York. Four Decades of Success, Excess, and Transformation by Thomas Dia. So that probably sounds really boring, but it's so interesting. I learned so much about so many different kinds of things, which is my favorite kind of nonfiction. Like, neither one of y'all are super into nonfiction, are you? Memoirs. Yeah. That's Personal mostly stories, my thing, right? Yeah. But um, so this was a po uh, history of the post 70s in New York. So just think about all the interesting things that happened. Like, the crack epidemic yeah. and rap music and the oh. economic, you know, um, yeah. like the boom and the bust periods, rising rents and um, like New York used to be like working class people, artists, you know, Manhattan mm -hmm. was a place that anyone could love. And so just like the trajectory of that, Rudy Giuliani, um, lots of really big characters and super interesting. So if you're one of those people who just like, um, falls into Wikipedia holes really easily if you hear someone say a random thing and it sends you in 20 directions and you have to research for you're that kind of person, my kind of person. <laughs> this this one is really, really good. And I recommend okay. that. All right. I will, I'll go this way. I did have, I mostly read nonfiction this year, but, I, and this one is not King. super happy. But it was very, very involving, and I just really like Stephen King. So this is one of the, like, I feel like Stephen King we has had a, new one this year. a super awesome book, and then kind of a dud, and then super awesome book. Yeah. Well, this one is super awesome, and um, it's it's really, really readable, and it has more of, like, a noir feel than his other stuff. So I'll just say that. I know I'm not really going for this one. You've never, it's an author, this indie author you've never heard of. <laughs> Only I can tell you about it. But, I mean, if we're being honest, this is what I really enjoyed this year. Miss Tammy, take it away. Oh. Um, so, basically, if I finished a book this year, it was really good. <laughs> and then from that very small pool, I tried to, um, you know, do it down to, like, the really great ones. Um, so, Totally Forked by Penny Reed. I know you guys are really surprised because I've never that. made it through an entire one of these without mentioning Penny Reed. <laughs> um, but this is a new series that spins off of um, the Winston Brothers. It's still in Green Valley, Tennessee, which is something that I love is that she's set up this small town um, southern community that is not trite. Um, and this one's Jackson James, and he um, he's in love with a movie star, and it's just... Um, it's a great one. Um, we had talked in another one about consent. It had great consent. It was just, it was a lot of fun. And I actually didn't think I was going to like it that much because Jackson James was kind of the bad guy in yeah. the Winston Brothers series. Um, but no, he's actually precious little muffin and I love him. <laughs> um, Exposed by Kristen Callahan. This is part of her Rockstar series. Oh my gosh, series. that was so good. It was yes. so good. And this was one that I've been waiting for for a long time. This is a couple that, you know, you knew were getting together. And there is a lot of, like, friction between them. And it was everything that I needed it to be. It was really good. You're correct. Um, Samantha Young has a new series. And both of the books came out this year that's in it so far. It's the Eight Air series. By Samantha Young, and they're set in Scotland. Samantha is Scottish, so they're very authentic, unlike Carrie Elwes's accent in the previews <laughs> for the castles thing. Um, <laughs> you know, and she actually scatters it with a lot of um, you know Scottish words and stuff that you know you might have to like be like, what? She's good at giving you context clues. Um, but Samantha is a friend of mine, and I beta read for her every once in a while. And it's always like things like I'm like, okay, that's 
we don't know what that is. That's not an American word. Um, so she kind of got to like let go of that and really um, let her Scottish flag fly. And I think that's really good for her um, to get to do that. It's beautiful settings. Like you feel like you're in the Scottish Highlands reading them. So that's lovely. Um, actor age, Eve Brown was good. Another good my favorite of the Brown sisters, which is interesting because I know some people that's their least favorite, and I think it really? just depends on the kind of person you are. But I love this one. Um, she was, she's very much on the spectrum. He was very much on the spectrum, and I don't know. I I just found it, I don't know, uplifting. It made I, me happy. I enjoyed that one as well. I, of the three men she's written about in that series, he was my favorite. Yeah, yeah. he was he was adorable because he's grumpy. I like grumpy guys. Is the author on the spectrum? I, I'm going to assume possibly yeah. because all three of the characters, oh, okay. the female characters, I feel like someone work. in her life probably is. Maybe. Yeah. Um, Fake by Kylie Scott. This is the only Kylie Scott I've ever read. Um, and I forget who recommended it to me, but I read it and it was really fun. It was, um, so he's a movie star and he would come into this restaurant Every once in a while, and this girl always waited on him, and circumstances happened in which she became his fake girlfriend, moved into his oh, big I've, mansion. I've been wrecking you. That's a recommendation. That's um, a And it's just a really, it's a really good, you know, it's one of those romances that pulls you in pretty quick. And um, I used to not like things with like movie stars and stuff. I really think it was Kristen Callahan who got me out of that. Um, but, yeah, I thought it was it was one that I not only made it through, but was like, hey, that was great. <laughs> um, and then Blood Air by Alona Andrews is not necessarily a romance in that it didn't, they did not have their happily ever after at the end. But if you're an Alona Andrews fan and you've read the Kate Daniels series and you're like, for the love of God, Derek and what's her name need to get together and this needs to work out this is the series where that's going to happen and so it was very exciting to get them you know like closure. moving into that direction and um i'd kind of burned out on the kate daniels series eventually like it just got a little too complicated for me i've said this before about books with a lot of world building like I just hit a point where I'm like, I can't remember who all these 50 people are and what their different, like, mm -hmm. powers are and all that stuff. And so I'd actually kind of hit a wall with that and given up. Um, so this was nice to be like, yes, I remember. I love you guys and the way you write. And, yeah. um, and then one that actually came out last year. I think it was late last year, so I'm going to let it count. Mm -hmm. uh, and also not a romance. has some romance aspects, but... The Invisible Life of Abby LaRue by V.E. E. Schwab. That. Um, that was fun. And I think something that made this a lot different for me is that I did the audiobook version. Oh. Um, and I don't normally do audiobooks. And if I do, I do, that's when I do my nonfiction mm -hmm. um, is audiobooks. But I was, I knew that I had like in the period of a week, three days that I was going to be on the road a lot. Um, and so I was like, I need something. And I, this was a book that I'd always wanted to read, but it's kind of thick and I just hadn't gotten into it. And the reader was so good mm -hmm. and it's just, it can, make, it can make a break an audio book. Yeah. And it's just a fascinating story. It's a girl in the 1600s who makes a deal with. We're going to call it the devil, but that's really a point of the book. It's like we don't know what the deal is with him. Um, and basically she gets to live forever, but no one remembers her. So, like, she could walk in this room, say something to us, and walk out. And by the time she made it to the stairs, none of us would remember that she was in here. Did you think it sounded odd? Like, I feel like I would still take that deal. <laughs> Forever, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've thought about it yeah. a lot. Like, would I take that deal? And I'm, I mean, I, I don't, I, it just, I mean, some of it did seem sad, you know, that nobody remembered her ever, but also it really did afford her a lot of freedom. Yes. Um, and that was kind of, oh, kind of the point of the book, I think, is how much, you know, 
what would you exchange for complete freedom? So and she was a woman in what 16th century France or whatever. Her life was very, you know, what very, she could have yeah. done was was really very really limited. limited. So I mean, it gave her a much larger life. Let's I just mean, say yeah. that. I mean, she had amazing experiences. It's just a and V. E. Schwab, which is Victoria Schwab, she's a beautiful writer. Like she's mm-hmm. just very almost lyrical with it. She she has this van- fantastic voice, um, and it just it, it and it was this concept that was completely out of left field. You it's know? a good high concept. Very like either time travelers like like one of those. I actually thought that book would be more buzzed about than it was. Yeah, you know because I've not heard of it. It's a cool hook. You know, it I is. like that hook. And, and yeah. beautifully written. So. It is. Yeah, it's, I thought it was good. It's a lovely. and So she might have gotten scurried by the year that, you know. Yes, and I think that I think that probably played into it. Um, but it, it, it's, it would probably be my top read of the entire year. And um, I always, if I like a book, I always pass it off to my mom. And she... You know, she'll either be like, is there another one in that series? You know, she doesn't say a ton about them. But with that one, she said, this is a book that I didn't want to end. She was like, I just did not want it to end. And then she hasn't read anything since because she wants to sit with it a little longer. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to add that. I put a check mark. (laughs) On <laughs> Hoopla, I believe. Right? Yeah, the the, the audio's audio is on Hoopla. Okay, um, that's where I did the audio book version, and I was even able to listen to it at a little bit faster of a speed mm-hmm. and still, because sometimes when you speed it up just a little bit, you lose some of that, the you know the quality the, the of the reader. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but even, I mean, I just did it slightly, um, but I was still able to retain that, and it was it was wonderful. Like. I meant to just do it in the car, and it got to where I was like, as I was getting ready in the morning yeah. and all sorts of, you know, any time that I was alone with my phone, I was like, okay, and what happened next? Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. So I've got, I've got a list here, and I've read both. I've read romance, I read fiction, I have a couple of memoirs in here. Probably, and this is in my, on my, in my, on my mind because I just finished it. It is called uh, Passing by Nigella. Larson, Nella Larson, sorry, and it is a short story. It's on Hoopla, and it's about uh, two women um, in 19, I believe it's 1920s Harlem, 1930s Harlem. Um, no, it's later than that, maybe the 40s. But anyway, um, this lady, um, she's enjoying a drink um, at a whites-only establishment, and she's light enough to pass, so she's sitting there drinking, and she notices a woman is staring at her, and she gets nervous, and she's about to be called, found out. And the woman comes over to her, and it reveals herself as her long-lost childhood friend, who not only is passing in that moment, is passing in her entire life. She has married um, a white man who hates Negroes, this sounds like... And this sounds a lot like Brit Bennett's The Vanishing Half. <laughs> it does. And there's actually a version of this where she has written a foreword for it oh, as well. A version okay. of this. Um, and it's now a Netflix movie. And if yeah. you have an hour and a half, the movie is excellent. It's oh, really, right. really good. Well, okay. It's really good. This. this is on Hoopla too. And it is, it is on Hoopla. And I five-starred it, thought it was fantastic. There's a lot to be said. There's a lot going on about colorism in the black community, and then wh- what if, what if, are you, basically, what did she give up to have this life of ease? You know, because her husband's rich, she, her daughter's in Swiss boarding school, but she doesn't have any of the touchstones to who she was, mm-hmm. and she can't indulge that. And um, Irene, who is the other friend, is both, um, is envious a little of the life that she has, and then she's also um, concerned about her safety if it comes out that she's not 100% white. Um, so that passing, really good. Um, Harlem Shuffle by Colson Whitehead. I love that too. Um, I know at one point it was so funny, I came in and told, we were talking about the book, 
And I said, well, I'm at this page. And Sarah was on almost the exact same page. <laughs> yeah. She was like, wait, this one's there. This same page. Um, and this is really good. It's also it's set in like the 60s Harlem? 60s maybe? Harlem. Yeah, just a little um, bit. And a gentleman earlier. whose cousin gets him in to uh, in with some dangerous fellas and how he just wants to run his furniture store and take care of his wife and he wants to be a little better than his father was and he kind of keeps getting in these situations and he can't quite get up and he's but you want to root for him you want everything to turn out yeah. for him even though he's doing some illegal activity you want him to work you want it to work out you want him and it's a beautiful portrait of Harlem it's the, at that time as uh, well yeah like the scene setting was was beautiful yeah. like it just really really came alive and I, I'm a huge Colson Whitehead fan yes, I love and Colson as well. I talk about him a lot but what I really liked about this one is um, I had told Kristen like to me it was like really musical the way the the prose was I don't know it just kind of evoked its setting in a way that was really yeah. pleasing and I loved the characters they were really um, very well drawn yeah very very well drawn and it is a good mix for me it's that sweet spot between like it's it's serious it's a literary work you, you know no one's gonna side eye you for reading it you know um, you know you got your bona fides it's it's a good book, but it's also not super dark, and it's not about, like, a middle-aged white professor's affair with his, yeah. <laughs> with his student and his, you know, midlife crisis and seeing it there. You know, I you read know one the of those. Did not enjoy it. You know the kind of book I'm talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that. So, uh, yeah, I really liked it, and it was, um, it was cheerful without being... Yes, I'll give you that. Yeah, you I that. love that one. Um, the Devil You Know by Kit Rocha. This is the second of her Mercenary Librarian series. Oh, fun. Um, and this is Maya and Gray's story. Um, it's set in post. It's set in twenty six. No, twenty two sixty. I think Atlanta. Um, they, and it's they are fighting against what the. Tech Corp, which is the uh, the government entity that has kind of taken over everything, and is training is training clones. Basically, um, they take kids when they're little and they make clones of them, and then they also train them to either be a soldier or to be someone who hoards information or um, trains them to be lethal. Just all kinds of things, and they're bad people. And uh, this is a group that has broken off from them. All of them are former Tech Corps agents. And um, they've kind of broken off, and they're trying to set things right for the people in their community. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned earlier that the 50 characters. There are a lot of characters in this book. And not only that, there's a, at some point, they were just case numbers. And so they get reference for their case number. I can't keep up with any of that. And I don't bother to. I'm like, fine. I don't even know that. I'm just not going to. But this is really good. The third one comes out next year. I've already in August. I've already pre-ordered it. I cannot wait. This does not sound like stories. something you usually read. You really it's very, it out. It's yeah. It's very science fictiony. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is so good. I, I just love, love that it. for you. I love the characters, and we do have both books here at the library. Cool. Um, books that you and I have talked about. Clovis with you forever. Um. A fourth in her Bergman series, I do believe. And those books are just well written, great characters. It's a series, but they also are standalone. Yes, you can very standalone those. And very, very good. They are on the audios on Hoopla. You can get them on Overdrive as well. Um, I think there's a couple ebooks that are on Hoopla too. But um, they're really, really, really good, and I can't wait for the next one no, in the series. No, it is an absolutely delightful series. It's one of those, you know, like the Winston brother, you know, like you just want to join that family. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, yes. like you're like, I would like to be one of you, please. Yes, I love it. <laughs> um, something else you, that's not normally what I read, but I really enjoyed it, uh, the final revival of Opal and Nev. I've talked about this a lot this year. 
And this is about a, it's written as a um, rock bio in a way. Um, Opal and Nev were this 70s uh, music duo. And what happened at, there's this concert that they give that erupts into a race riot, basically. Mm -hmm. And someone is killed. And at that point, Opal and Nev stopped recording together, stopped working together. And the it's written as a the author is trying to put together wants to piece this together because her father was the man who was killed, and she writes for a music magazine and she has spun this as kind of a series. Hey, let's find out what happened to Opal and Opal and Nev. I, you know, I want to yeah. do some research, and so she gets to talk to Opal. She gets to talk to Nev, and it kind of traces their whole history together. So, it sounds like extremely so my good. kind of thing. It, I was going to oh say, gosh, that is very so much good. Sarah's jam. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Nev, the, the girl who's writing it, her father, who died at the concert, was having an affair with Nev. She was a baby at the time. Mm. Was having an affair with, uh, with Opal. Sorry, not Nev. Having an affair with Opal. And it's built around the reunion concert. They're going to have a reunion concert. Um, at one point, we're getting all the background of every character. At some point, it just becomes about Opal, and I think it loses a little bit mm -hmm. when it does that. But she is fabulous and fierce, and I wish she was a real person that I could meet. I, it's fantastic. It's by Donnie Walton. It's her first novel. Oh, okay. And I cannot wait to see what well, else she writes. You have sold me on that one. It's that so that sounds very good. It's so good. Um, and we do have that here as well. Um Let's see. I also want a second at your age, Eve Brown. I enjoyed that. Um, also really enjoyed, and I've read all of the J.D. Robb series, Faithless in Death was her new one this year. And a lot of her books can seem like a formula um, because she's written so many of them. But this case was about a, um, it was kind of cult. And they had these women who were, um, who couldn't leave their husband. They were kind of trapped in these relationships. And the Eve, of course, gets them freed. It, it, at, and it, it may sound like I'm spoiling it, but it's really not. Because you kind of need to know, that's what really, really made it five star for me, is to watch these women get their lives back and how they got them back. And it kind of went beyond her usual someone's dead who did it kind of thing, at least to me. Are it, they standalone reads? A lot of, yes. The okay. characters carry over, they do. But anything you need to know, it kind of fills you in with a little backstory. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can read them without, uh, without having read the rest good. of them. But Faith is in Death is really, really, really good. Uh, books I hated, because I want to talk about a couple <laughs> books that I absolutely despised. Um, Dal A for Aunties, and I have gone on about this in another video, um, by Jesse Santato. And it's billed as a romance, and it's not a romance, as a second chance romance. And <laughs> um, She's a photographer working for her family's business. Um, she goes out on a date that goes wrong, and her date ends up dead. And so she and her aunt shove them in a trunk. No, shove them in an ice chest. That's what it is. And uh, the ice chest gets picked up and taken off to an island where they're staging a wedding the next day. So she spends a lot of time trying to get this body back. And I was just angered at how this, in a year where we've had so much death and loss, the way this body was just, manhandled and disrespected and deaf angered me to no the refrigerator end. trucks yes in, in exactly yeah. yeah it just angered me to no end i'm like do you have no and no respect for the dead just none and it's built around this second chance romance because the resort where they're putting on the wedding is run by her college boyfriend they could have left out the death and just put the other end and it would have been fine and I would have enjoyed it but them constantly propping this body up all over it even winds up weekend in the Bernie's. wedding <laughs> at some point like a weekend at Bernie's <laughs> thing and I was like this is supposed to be funny and maybe in 2018 it would have been 
Um, Remember Big Summer? That yes. That, that one that we hated. Because it had this surprise yeah. murder, and I'm like, what <laughs> did in the it. world? <laughs> so, yeah, I did not enjoy that. Hated that book. One, oh, God, I hated it. <laughs> when Stars Collide, Susan Elizabeth Phillips, it hurts my heart. Hurt at my heart. You love her. To one star. I love Susan Elizabeth Phillips. Anytime anyone asks me for a recommendation, the first book out of my mouth is Match Me If You Can by her, which I still recommend. It's a fabulous book. Fabulous romance novel. This is a continuation of her Chicago Star series, which I also just love, love, loved. And the problem is, it's a she's an opera singer. He's a former. He's a football quarterback. Um, and partial. And she has a misconception of him that he poorly tr treated one of her female friends poorly. That turns out not to be true. He has. She has to apologize. What I didn't like is she's having problems with her voice. She's having some confidence problems with her mm -hmm. voice. And so he decides he's going to fix it. She is a professional opera singer, has been for years, but yet this football man is going to fix her problem. Mm -hmm. And to fix her problem, he just demands that she constantly sing for him which every single time he demanded her saying like she was some kind of freaking jukebox, mm. I was like, stop it, stop it. <laughs> and we get to, there's even at one point where he starts playing games with her, um, like trying to withhold his attention from her. And we can, this is a book I actually will say was suffered from having dual point of view because we knew why he thought he was right. And I was like, no, you're not. No, right. <laughs> that's, no, you don't want to do that. No. <laughs> and we knew why, how she was feeling. So if she had lost someone to suicide. She was feeling that was tied into why she lost her voice. I'm sorry, you just can't yell that back at someone. You just can't. Yeah. Um, so, and I've been disappointed recently by her Susan Elizabeth Phillips recent releases. There's even a couple I just have not read because I've, the reviews were so poor. I, I don't know what's happened there, but um, yeah, this was one mm -hmm. of my least favorites of the year. I was disappointed. Well, that and that reminds me of the latest Helen. Yes, we differ on that though. Yeah. I loved it. You were I was a indifferent a little bit. I I mean I think it was a well written book, but I don't think it was a romance novel. Um. Because the book was about her overcoming, you know, this block that she had where she wasn't able to play and um, all of that. I mean, it's it's the similar, you know, like an artist who's not being able to do their art. Um, but the romance in there just didn't even, it, it was like very secondary and actually felt forced to me. Um, and I can see that. So, you know, in a year again, when we need certain things, again, it was beautiful. And I think um, anyone who's struggling, you know, maybe that book would be helpful for them. Yeah. But the book's about the struggle. I, I'll agree with you on that. We're talking about the heart principle, um, which is the third in her Kiss Quotient series. Yes. Um, I will agree with you that I don't, there was a romance in it. The Happily Ever After felt not forced, uh, second, like it wasn't important. I didn't yeah. care about that. Because I didn't want her, actually, I fully agree with you, it's not a romance, because I didn't want her to be in a relationship. I wanted her to be happy with herself. With who she was, yes. And when she reached that point, I was satisfied. That's mm -hmm. what I loved about it so much. What I loved about it is, at some point, her um, father has a stroke, and she goes in, she has to be a caretaker, and it burns her out. And as someone who I helped with my grandfather when he was older and needed a lot more assistance, I was assisting him all the time, and I got to where I was like, I, I need a day where I'm not here all day. And it's not that I didn't love him, and it's not that I didn't want to spend time with him, but I needed that break. And I would get that break. I was lucky enough that I would get that break. So many people who are caretakers don't. They don't get the breaks that they need. And 
I think that's why this resonated so much with me because she is it's a it's a thing. You want to take care of this person because you love them and you feel guilty because it's absolutely killing you at yeah. times. So I will agree with you, not a romance. Um, but I did think if you take that aspect out of it, yes. it was a very, very good book. Yes. It was Again, one of my favorites of the year. Beautifully written and And it also based yeah. on the author's own experience. Right. I you know, it was a good book, but it was billed as a romance. It was put in yes. that series. I think if they would have pulled it out and this been just a different book by her and not part of that series, I would have approached it differently. Uh, yes. Because I it was not, the other two books had, you know, like you, you've prepped yourself for this kind of story and then that's not the story you got. Yes. Um, and the other two were kind of dreamy romances. Someone mm -hmm. was a woman, someone on the spectrum, someone who wasn't on the spectrum. Yeah. And yeah, I can see that. Yeah. yeah. I just, so I wouldn't say that it was a book that I hated this year. It was just a book that. It did not you wanted work something for else me. From it. Yes. It did yeah. not work for me the way that I wanted it to work for me. Yeah. I could see that. But I did finish it, so if I finished it, it's a good book. <laughs> <laughs> if I made it past the 10% mark, <laughs> it was good. Do we not finish books? I, and I'll say that um, when I really got into Goodreads and wanting to keep track of what I was reading, I was chasing my challenge total. Mm -hmm. And so any book I put more than 20 minutes into, I was going to finish it because otherwise I wasted that time and I'm not going to meet my challenge goal. And um, what I did was I started making my challenge much lower to mm -hmm. where I can easily reach it. And if I didn't like a book, I just stopped reading it. <laughs> I think quitting is for winners yeah. and you should like life is too short i yeah i quit more than i finish and i am okay with that yeah i mean it's not school yeah yes yeah i'm not going to be quizzed on any of this stuff um and sometimes i will quit one because i know it's a good book but i'm not in the place for it right now and so i'll come back to it later um the new sarah mclean i've only made it through the prologue because I just couldn't, I couldn't get there. And I know that if Sarah McLean wrote it, I'm going to love it. Mm -hmm. But I have to be in the right place for it. So I'm not going to go back to it until I'm like, I really need a historical romance. So probably what's going to happen is season two of Bridgerton will drop. I will watch wait. it. And then I'll be like, <laughs> yep, I'm ready for some historical romance again. And then I'll, I'll hit that one up. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I have no problem... And sometimes I probably quit them even too soon. But you need to grab me early. Yeah. Yeah. I Like you, like you said, life is too short to read something you don't enjoy. And I read for entertainment and yeah. enjoyment. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I read for information, not as often as I do just to. I am wondering enjoy. if to get back over the hump, to get to being, like, that I will have to kind of read through some, you know, maybe not put step down quite so quickly and you know challenge myself a little bit so it's on the table but no by nature I'm a quitter yep. <laughs> a <laughs> book I have not read yet I don't know I, I'll say I'm looking forward to it I'm on hold for it Will um, Will Smith's memoir oh okay um, which I'm, I presume we'll get in a couple weeks there's um, going to be a lot about his sex life in there. I don't really know. <laughs> I saw the interview he did with Oprah. They love to talk about it. And I was it. like. <laughs> so now, but he also he intimated at writing about how the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air came mm, about, which I love. So how his music career came about, which I love in some of his movies. And I'm like, okay, if we're getting a little behind the scenes stuff, that's great. Yeah. I don't care anything about his and Jada's marriage, like at all. So... I don't know. I'm on the fence. I have a friend who recently read it. Okay. Um, I guess she read it this week. And she absolutely loved it. And okay. And said that the first couple of chapters, though, are really emotionally, like, pulled it out of you. Okay. <laughs> so, I, that's I, not my first-hand experience, but I did see someone okay. talk about it a lot on the Facebook. Okay. All right, I'm a little more optimistic now because uh, I love Will Smith. I, I have 
for you know 30 yeah. years now so I I think I you know I want to think I'd like this memoir yeah. but I'm like mm. um I did read she means well by Quinta Brunson mm -hmm. uh Quinta is a comedian she started out on BuzzFeed um and she and her big thing what really got her jump started is she did a video series where she played a woman who went out with a guy, uh, a woman who had never been to nice places on her dates. And uh, I think he, they went to, like, what, the most famous one is they went to uh, get popcorn. She went to, went to the movie theater, and he bought popcorn. She's like, oh, you got money. <laughs> She's like, oh, we get popcorn and candy? Dan, you got some money. <laughs> and um, that took off, became viral, and it kind of launched her career. She does have a series coming out on ABC next month. I'm very excited about called Abbott Elementary. Oh um, yeah, that does look. It's cute. one that she's written, produced. Awesome. So I'm very excited about it. And she means well. Was very very good. I enjoyed it a lot. About how she came to BuzzFeed and just how her comedy has evolved over the years, and it was really good. Um, I think that's everything that I had on my list. Oh. And The Dating Playbook by Farrah Rashawn, which is the second um, of a series that started last year with, if I hadn't tried to say it, it would come right out of me, <laughs> um, something boyfriend, Dating Playbook, that's, no, that's one I've just written. Dang it, I can't think of the name of the first one. <laughs> but anyway, this is the second in the series, uh, Taylor's a fitness um, guru who a football player hires her to get him back into playing shape. So there's a lot of football, and there's a lot of sporty mm -hmm. in it, and uh, it was really, really good. I enjoyed it. I think that's all I've got. Um, any final wrap-up from you two ladies? Anything you want to get out about our year in review, our book year in review? Is there something that you're really looking forward to coming out? <sighs> the third book in the Mercenary Library <laughs> series, yeah. which I've mentioned. Um, I'm sure Farrah is going to release a third book in... Um, her series, and I really want to see what Talia Hibbert does next. Um, mm -hmm. There's no more Brown sisters, uh, so I kind of want to see what that is, what, where what her going. next book, yeah, yeah, where she's going. I think it, Sylvia Marino Garcia, she had um, the one last year. And of course, I can't think of the title now, and hopefully you can fix that for me. In, I will. In, uh, I'm writing a note. But she <laughs> has, um, all I can think of is my spoiler line about it, Mexican Gothic. Mexican Gothic. Oh, I, I love that. I love that one, and she, this one is already out, and I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, Velvet was the night that I am really excited about. I think there's several, like, big name authors that are coming out with, one's coming up so we can look forward to sometimes something that's a little more familiar is is nice to get you, get you back yes in the exactly yes um i'm looking for beck mcmaster has a series that this is going to sound so dumb i this this is the problem with urban fantasy and paranormal romance is sometimes the premise sounds so dumb until you actually start reading them um but she has one about Dragon Shifters, a series. Ah. Which sounds so weird. I don't expect that to come out of your mouth. No. <laughs> and it's set in like this like Viking era thing. And I really got into the like her the previous ones, oh, probably around Christmas time last year. I really read through mm -hmm. those. And the next book's been delayed. So I'm really hoping it comes out soon. And the next book in that Blood Air series by Alona Andrews. Um, and, of course, if you guys don't know, a lot of books are being delayed in publishing because of supply chain issues. I'm going to bl blame supply chain issues on everything that goes wrong I in my so. life from here on mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> That's where my will to read is. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a, a supply <laughs> chain issue. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Those are what I'm waiting on, but I think I've heard that both have been pushed back. And, again, supply chain issues. Thank you, COVID, for yeah. all these wonderful things that you have changed in our lives. Uh, <laughs> so that's what, I'm, that's what I'm looking forward to. I think I, I'm very much in a headspace where 
paranormal appeals to me mm -hmm. more than other things right now because I need to be in a world where these things don't exist. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, you have other things to worry about, like dragon shifters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's so weird. To say. Beck Newmaster is a really talented writer. If you have not tried any of her stuff, she is just fantastic. She can make the absolute craziest things seem completely normal. Well, I'm looking forward to Kristen reading more Safa. This is <laughs> this is new. We're gonna we're gonna all branch out. I'm gonna read romance. You're gonna read Safa. <laughs> I'll pick up some nonfiction. You'll get some biographies. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, no, I don't really have any, like, I think we should be easy on ourselves. Yes, I'll agree. It's mm -hmm. okay. I mean, if you're not living your best life, you have, and that has been, I think, a good thing that has come out of the pandemic, because I do not feel alone if, you know, I'm yeah. having our time. It's like, I know a lot of other people too, are too, um, so I think we can count things like web comics and 10% of the nonfiction yeah. books that many that I've started and finished. And, you know, we don't have to hold ourselves to unbreakable standards. Like I never judge other people to the same extent that I've judged yes. myself. Yes. So yes. I'm trying to, uh, I don't know when this got all self-help, but I am trying to, show ourselves you know, more grace. yeah, show ourselves more grace and it'll come back. Right. I agree. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, well, we'll close down. I'm sure Sarah has a library to run, so we'll get her back to that. <laughs> Tammy and I are just going to go have lunch. <laughs> it's also very important. <laughs> it is very important. Uh, but I want to thank Sarah for uh, guesting today. No um, and as always, lovely Tammy Blackwell. It's always so I good to see you. I enjoy being here so much. Yeah. I love having you here. It's so fantastic. Fine. Go have lunch. Have yeah. fun without me. <laughs> and we are going to have fun without you. Yes. Um, thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>